Dan, throughout my schooling career, I focused on the brain and how the brain can explain the mind, and I've spent the rest of my life worrying and wondering about it. I really want to hear your th deep thoughts on how the brain can explain the mind, how it works. Yeah. Well, a lot of this then probably you know better than I do, a lot of the, a lot of the details of the physiology that, that I uh, tend to gloss over. But let's, let's try to get the bird's eye view here. When you're awake, your senses are bombarded by more than a million little signals every, every split second. Mm. Tremendous rush of data coming in. Right. Now, some of it, it hardly really counts as data. It's just, it's just like a shadow on the wall. It just comes and goes without leaving any trace, without being picked up in any sense. But, of course, what the brain is designed to do is to pick up and analyze little bits of this. So let's just take vision for a moment and recognize that the rods and cones in your eye are designed to register those photons and turn them into nerve signals, to transduce them. So now we've got little nerve signals moving along through the optic nerve, uh, uh, simplifying already. Uh, and each one of those carries some information about some fleeting thing that was going on out there in the visual world. These get get moved to areas which which put them together in interesting ways and a little bit of uh, an edge gets detected or a bit of motion or a bit of color or or uh, uh, well let's just take motion color edges location something's going on over here now consider each of those little moments a sort of little micro judgment it's not yet a conscious judgment it's just that part of the brain has decided that this sort of thing is going on right here now. Now we've got thousands, hundreds of thousands of little micro judgments going on, and those they're are subconscious. We're not aware of this them. Is, this is all. This is all just the optic uh, nerve, different that's parts right, of the middle exactly. brain, all different. That's right. Yeah. And it turns out the brain has lots of specialist areas. Right. There's ones that concentrate on that are especially good at color, or particularly good at motion, or particularly good at identification of objects or location of objects. Mm -hmm. These are s distinct. So now, what happens to all of this specialized work? Does it, does it then all get put into registration somewhere for the great, grand, wonderful show? <laughs> and the answer is no, mm -hmm. not really. Um, what happens is that uh, previous events, what just happened a moment before, has a profound influence on what's going to happen next because one of the things that happens is, as it were, signals get sent down the path saying, check this out, check that <laughs> out, might it be this, or don't think of it like this. Now, now I'm putting that in a very figurative way, but there's lots of modulation it's amazing. coming from higher brain Sometimes areas. Sometimes even down. more fibers go yeah, down yeah, than exactly, come up. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so that there's a great churning mill right, right. of of activities going on, and these are not all beautifully in marching order with some sort right. of a drum major that makes everything right. happen. Right. There's this competition. So we have waves of sort of competitive activity going on and picking up allies, joining forces, and then gradually creating a few different accounts of what's going on in the world. This is just looking at vision now, but, but this is happening sort of in all the senses. Now, what's going to happen to them? They're going to, in effect, compete for temporary domination in the whole brain. That is, domination in the sense of determining what gets thought about next, what gets paid attention to next, what features of what gets thought about are focused on. So this is, out of this competition comes attention. Mm. We have to recognize that it's not that there's this boss in there with a searchlight <laughs> that's aiming the searchlight <laughs> here and there and attending to one thing or another. Well, you, could, you can use that metaphor, but then you realize somebody has to be giving the boss directions <laughs> and, and suggesting, hey, pay attention to me, pay attention to me. And so it's much more the attraction of the searchlight than the searchlight being intentionally directed, although, of course, we do have the experience of, of deliberately looking over and or this deliberately ignoring some part of our world. All of this activity arises 
not just once, but in multiple channels at once. And what what we think of as the stream of consciousness, mm -hmm. I claim, is a sort of edited history which is only retrospectively <laughs> available. We find out later what we were <laughs> conscious of. Even a momentary later. E yeah. Even a momentary later. The idea that there's this, this mantle uh, or this crown of consciousness that rests on the, this head and then that head uh, and that we can perfectly time these, that's itself an illusion. Um, if, you, if you think of this as uh, a competition with temporary dominance, it's a little bit like playing king of the mountain, you know, <laughs> who's on top of the mountain now? Almost immediately replaced. But there's nothing, it's not as if, if you get to be king of the mountain, then all of a sudden you glow. <laughs> That's the bad idea, that consciousness yeah. is this extra property. Yeah. No, if you're king of the mountain, then, then you're simply going to have an effect on what happens for next. For the moment. For the moment, and yeah. on what happens next. Yeah, you and, call this fame in the brain. Yeah, it's, I call it fame to distinguish it from what's otherwise very tempting, and that's television. I said, <laughs> being on television and being famous are two different yeah, things. Yeah. Everybody appreciates that. Yeah. Somebody can be on television and seen by millions of people and not be famous. Right. Because, okay, they're on the medium, but big deal. For instance, uh, a news program and there's inoculation and we see an anonymous <laughs> nurse sticking a needle into an anonymous arm. <laughs> and 50 million people see that nurse stick the needle into that arm. Is she famous? No. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's being on television. It's not being famous. Uh -huh. Fame is not a momentary phenomenon. It is not being in a medium. It is having a certain sort of repercussion that has mm. to have some temporal mm. extension. Mm. And Fame in the brain is my analogy for consciousness. It's not that there's this extra medium in the brain, the conscious medium. It's that some events in this great unconscious turmoil become more famous than others, and that's what it is to be conscious. <laughs> You've used this wonderful term, multiple drafts, in, uh, in contradiction to the so-called Cartesian theater. So how does that work? Uh, think about what happens with a, with a scholarly article. Uh, the author writes it and, and then redrafts it and sends it to a few friends and they send them some comments and then it gets redrafted again and then it gets sent off to the journal and then it gets edited some more. And by the time it's actually published in a hard copy, it's been through many different drafts. In the hard copy, maybe nobody reads that. <laughs> That's just for the archives. All of the influences happened in response to the earlier drafts. And I wanted to drive home the point that this is the way the brain works too, that the, the, the work that's being done by consciousness is not done, as it were, only with the final published archival version. It's being done all the time. And in fact, the archival version is, is maybe a pale copy of what's been going on and just one of many competing versions. And so that the idea we have that our stream of consciousness is, is unitary and fixed and, uh, and, and that we can't deal with something until it becomes unitary and fixed. This is a mistake. <laughs> so uh, this is the hardest thing for people to accept in my work. Uh, uh, supposing I'm right, they just have a hard time understanding, let alone uh, agreeing to this. It seems as if the things that I'm conscious of are very definitely there now, and I couldn't be wrong about that. And what I'm saying is that is itself a somewhat illusory conviction. This is the Cartesian theater. That's right. The Cartesian theater I'm sitting is the place that Descartes imagined, which was not even in the brain. <laughs> it was this immaterial place. And a lot of people gave up on this dualism and said, there's got to be a place in the brain, which is this sort of, this is, the, this is where the, the draft of record <laughs> is first read and this is where the final show takes place. And then all of the responses of the conscious self to action happens after that final revision has been done and, and signed off on. And I'm saying, no, the work is being accessed all along the way. There isn't any final draft. There's just lots of different drafts, and their influences are... Uh, distributed in both 
space and time. So we can't really tell. There isn't any answer to the question of whether did this revision happen only in memory after consciousness or did this happen before consciousness? Uh, uh, that seems to make sense as if of any feature, was it in our consciousness or not? I don't remember it now. Uh, that itself, I call that very question into, into question, say that's not the right question to ask. Well, the multiple drafts is very consistent with a neuroanatomical analysis of the brain because you have all yep. these different levels and all yep. the different sensory systems and in each one, different things are happening and the influence from above is even more significant sometimes than yep. from below. So you have very complicated interactions. And, and there's no finish line. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a tremendous uh, bias in thinking about consciousness to think of consciousness as the sort of finish line. Ta da! Yeah. Now this consciousness, then what? Oh, well, what am I supposed to say? Well, you're supposed to say, and then what happens? What, what are the sequels of coming into consciousness? And recognize that you haven't really got a theory of consciousness until you've answered that question. And then what happens? And then you begin to see that some of the features that you might have thought were pre-conscious, now you might think, well, maybe they're post-conscious. <laughs> and then you begin to realize that the whole difference between pre-conscious and post-conscious is a sort of illusion. Mm. It's, a, it, it's not like the equator. The equator is a is a just a theoret theoretical line, but it's equidistant from the poles, and we can map it precisely. Um, is there a line in the brain such that things that are coming in they haven't crossed the line yet? They haven't crossed, now they've crossed the line. Now they're post conscious. That's what I want to deny and yeah. say: get rid of the idea that there is a finish line. Crossing that finish line marks the beginning of consciousness and or the end of consciousness and the beginning of memory. Yeah. Uh, those get all mixed up. <laughs>